Welcome to Exceeding Your Fundraising Goals Even During Inflation, featuring Barbara O'Reilly and other fundraising experts. This is an Ariba uh, webinar uh, exclusively for the nonprofit community. We want to thank you for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is David Jost. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer. Uh, I am here at Ariba. I also happen to be the moderator and uh, co-host with uh, Barbara today and, and with our special guest who we'll introduce in just a moment. I'm going to go ahead and uh, just move forward to a little bit of what's going to be happening today so you have an idea, but I'm not going to you know, read it verbatim. Uh, we're going to give you the more formal welcome and introductions. We're going to hear from you. Uh, we are going to be talking. Uh, yes, we're going to say it. Uh, it's one of those things you don't want to whisper. There is inflation. There are some economic challenges. We're going to talk about them and the impact they're having, but we're uh, going to move very quickly and fast forward to how you can exceed your goals even during these times with some really great advice, conversation and input from you. And we're also gonna have ample opportunity at the end, uh, hopefully for questions and answers, as well as throughout. I just wanna remind our hosts to please uh, unmute yourself if you're muted, our, our co-hosts, and so, because we'll be uh, turning to you in just a moment and uh, welcome everyone who's here as we move to a welcome of those who are uh, presenting today. Uh, in, in uh, conjunction with me. So first off, I'm going to go ahead and let you know that we have a, a very special guest who's joined us today, uh, a friend here of Ariva, part of Ariva, Meistersoft and Ariva Company, but more importantly to today's conversation, Ken Cleave, who is a fundraising auction and event expert uh, and co-president and CEO of Meistersoft uh, with a good number of years of experience. I always feel that's probably a more comfortable way to say it, but he's been doing this for quite some time. Welcome, Ken. Hey, thank you, David. Uh, it's nice to be here with everyone and uh, looking forward to sharing information and also answering questions that you have. Great. And uh, I want to, as I said, I'm David Jost. I'm Chief Marketing Officer and Moderator, uh, co-host with Barbara. And Barbara O'Reilly, uh, CFRE, is a, I, I think it's it's selling a shirt to just say fundraising expert. She's the principal and founder of Windmill Hill uh, Consulting. Uh, she has nearly 30 years of annual fund, major gifts, campaign fundraising experience at major nonprofit organizations, including Harvard University, you may have heard of it, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, Oxford University in England, and the American Red Cross. Her consulting firm, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about at the end here, Windmill Hill Consulting, is doing a phenomenal job of helping nonprofit organizations of all sizes cut through the noise and develop a profitable fundraising strategy that focuses on the resources, skills, and tactics they need to build more effective donor relationships and catapult their revenue. She serves as an immediate past president of the uh, Association of Fundraising Professionals, AFP in Washington, DC metro area, and is a former member of the advisory panel for uh, Rogare, the fundraising think tank in the UK. I, I think I heard you chuckle, Barbara. I always pause when I come at that one. Uh, she is a frequent guest presenter at national and international conferences and on various webinars hosted by AFP, uh, lots of other nonprofit organizations. And she's uh, very important in the conversation here, been a good partner and friend of Ariva, having been on multiple webinars for the nonprofit community uh, that we have presented together. Welcome, Barbara. Would you like to say a quick hello? And then we'll We'll kind of I mean, anything you'd like to share with folks as we get started today. Thanks, David. I'm delighted to be here and excited also to partner with Ken on this conversation. Terrific. We're going to go ahead and uh, just kind of uh, move forward here to uh, what's really important uh, for the success. And I think the overall enjoyment of today's session, and that is that this is a uh, an interactive webinar. It really is. We want to hear from you. So even now, we've, we've had a lot of people tell us where they're joining from, but we want you throughout today's session to go to the question box or the chat box. We're not picky. However you get the message to us, we will see it and, and make sure that we uh, include that in our conversation or in how we adjust today's uh, flow because it's very adjustable and very real time. But uh, we want you to share your questions, your insights, and your comments throughout. Uh, there's often, almost every time we do this, Barbara, I think you would agree there's a side conversation going on that's like a, a whole nother show, right? And it's wonderful. Everyone's really contributing and helping everyone out. So uh, we're going to begin by just starting with a, a, a little bit of a, a poll to get your, uh, your interactive muscles flexed. And I'm just going to go ahead and uh, launch this. You will see it up here in just a moment. Uh, you should be seeing that now. And it's basically, tell us about the in how inflation and really just economic challenges overall you know we've been a couple of years a lot of things that 
are sort of systemic and I think part of the landscape of impacting all of us, but what are the things that you've seen in terms of impact? Have you seen increased demand for services? Uh, have you seen higher operating costs? Uh, you know, staff members and supporters personally impacted, obviously, that is that something that you're that you're seeing as a pretty important part of the impact. Um, and I, I guess I'm just going to call this out because it's the reason for us doing this this session, really. Um, do you have reluctance or difficulty in asking for donations during these times? You know, are you are you in a sense pausing your fundraising because you you know you think that it just might not it, it might be tone deaf? Um, we've seen no impact uh, from inflation or the economy. Uh, very, you know, go ahead and respond. That we'd love to hear about that too. And, you know, see if there's something happening there. And then, lastly, for those of us who are just so overwhelmed that we don't really want to talk about, I've allowed you the option to answer. Don't even ask. I don't know where to begin. <laughs> so you have the option to choose that and others. But please go ahead and uh, let us know. You know how you're feeling today, because we we want to make sure we map that to the things that are pretty relevant. We think we've. We've hit quite a few of them, but I'm gonna go ahead and give you a five count backwards to let you finish. If you haven't answered yet, just about everyone's responded. So five, four, three, two, one. And I'm gonna end the poll, and then I'm gonna go ahead and display this so that you can see it. And uh, Barbara and Ken, uh, feel free to, you know, talk about what we're seeing here. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised. Um, I'm not surprised to see the higher operating costs. I'm not surprised to see a high percentage of staff members and supporters who are personally impacted. I'm curious that the amount that the percentage of those who responded is so low who have reluctance or difficulty in asking for donations. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm delighted that it's as low as it is. But um, oftentimes, as we hit these, ec these economic uncertainties, whether it's inflation or a recession, often that's that number would be higher. So I'm, I'm yeah. hoping that that number stays as low for our for our, um, our attendees today. No, that's a great point. You know, and, a, you know, it's very nearly a third of those answering. But, you know, and, and there's always some, you know, who wants to say we're reluctant to ask. I mean, that's what we all do. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think that we want to not just talk about are you reluctant to ask, but do you know lots of different ways to ask and how to be able to ask in a way that doesn't overwhelm? And, you know, what's the finesse? What are the finer points uh, that you had there? Anything to, to, you know, relate to there, Ken? One of the things I think that later on in the presentation, I will, um, I'll, we'll probably say this several times. Don't be afraid. Just don't be afraid. I mean, we're we're in this space for a reason, you know, to further our mission. We afraid, even though it's impacting us, doesn't mean it's impacting everyone the same mm -hmm. way. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, move us, uh, you know, uh, forward to another interactive exercise, and this one's ongoing. But I would like you all to just take a moment and just let us know what questions do you have about fundraising or doing what you do, you know, donor relations, uh, events, everything. Do you have uh, about, you know, how to do that during inflation in a challenging economy? Free flow it, throw anything in there you'd like to hear about, uh, challenge us a bit. We'll kind of take a look at those and, and uh, respond to those as we move forward as well. So I'm going to go ahead and move us uh, on to, uh, you know, a, a little bit of, uh, you know, I wouldn't say it's taboo subject, like some things that you kind of whisper, but I think there's a little bit of a notion of, you know, maybe not wanting to necessarily bring it up and, and just plow through. But I think an important thing to do, and we've talked about this, is to really understand that, you know, the reality is inflation is hitting everyone, especially hard these days, you know, and nonprofits are, are being hit particularly, uh, you know, hard, uh, especially on top of, of the recent pandemic, other challenges, et cetera, right? So as you saw, I'm not going to reiterate this, but the, the evidence, you know, kind of the, re the uh, research out there supports that as well. You know, fully a third of nonprofit leaders surveyed said they were reporting higher operating costs, and that was earlier in the year. 53% uh, are reporting increased demand for services. Uh, small minority uh, only are reporting that they actually have 12 months or more of liquidity, which is a little bit, you know, um, unnerving, right? And I think that at that point, we want to look at that and say, that's a, that's a very important thing to be thinking about. And I think what it all comes down to is this is a caring community. Uh, we're compassionate. Um, we are very attuned to the fact that our staff members and our supporters are impacted personally. What that means to them from a uh, the perspective of 
of uh, as human beings, but also what it means to your organization in terms of ability to, to you know, uh, retain staff members, attract staff members, be able to get the things done you need to do, right? Uh, it, you know, anything uh, related to that impact, you know, that we did not hit so far, Barbara can feel free to chime in, but I'm gonna just kind of move us forward to uh, away from the cloud, away from the, you know, from the depressing, you are probably saying, oh, okay, I just want to go under a rock, right? Um, and, you know, you might, you might say, well, you know, why even, you know, we should maybe pause our fundraising. Reluctance is, is really that, isn't it? It's pausing your fundraising. So I'm going to turn it over to Barbara to kind of carry us through here and Ken as well to kind of just talk about the topic of why you shouldn't pause your fundraising during these or any challenging economic times. Yeah, so I would say that, um, you know, fundraising, as we all know, is not something that you flick a switch and you turn on and off when it's convenient or when you uh, when you have time to do it. Uh, and in fact, in probably every instance, in, in all instances of organizations that have become mega brands, um, they were intentional about that consistency of fundraising over time. Uh, so that they can continue to grow and 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 build and scale in ways that we that we know them now. Um, and what do they say about forming new habits? That it's a, it's consistency is the is right. the biggest driver for forming new habits. So, just from that perspective, um, fundraising has to continue in some way, shape, or form. Now, our our immediate reaction when we hit economic uncertainties, whether it was the beginning of the pandemic in March 2020 or fall of 2021, when we thought we were out of the clear and then we weren't. Um, I've been in uh, organizations when, during other recessions and, uh, and I was, we were in the middle of a campaign at one organization when everything was, when all of the asks that we had planned and were doing had to stop. And, but that didn't mean we stopped our fundraising completely. We just readjusted. So there, um, we, we have to remind ourselves that, fun, that donors um, they yes, they might be affected and they will be affected in some way, but they also believe in your organization. So we've got to give them the, the space to make that decision whether or not they want to continue to give. Um, and um, Una Osili, who is um, one of the leading research experts at the Lilly School of Philanthropy, um, had once said in, in a presentation um, that inflation is the one economic factor that does seem to inf impact um, in a negative way fundraising. However, recessions don't, which is it, which is actually probably which well Una says it, so it's true. But um, because I think a lot of, of her um, her expertise, but we have to keep that fundraising going. We have to acknowledge that our donors, yes, they're going to probably re be, be giving more careful consideration to their fundraising to their their giving this year. But it doesn't mean that you don't ask. You don't assume that they are not going to support you. Yeah. Um, and you want to give them that space to continue to do the, to invest in the things that are important to them, which is if, it, if they've been supporting your organization, it, it will likely be that. Um, they, they may not be the biggest, the same gift, but as long as they continue to give, we want to focus also on that retention, which we'll talk about in a little bit. You know, I love this, uh, you know, someone just said, don't make the decision for your donors. And, you know, that's a wonderful comment. Um, you know, uh, Ken, I see this third point. I know you always are, are sharing this in, in other places. We, I think we all are, some of us were, uh, I know Barbara, you and I, about a year ago, we were doing a, don't let the Delta variant pause oh, your yeah. fundraising. And yeah. it's interesting because I've heard from so many people that we've worked with and that are, or even that just joined us about how, that advice really, you know, it made a difference. They kept going and did something, right? And, That's right. And I mean, I, if you don't ask, as an organization, if you don't ask, your donors will presume that everything is going okay mm -hmm. and that you don't need them anymore. Mm -hmm. And we know right. that even when even when we're, we're, we're thick with funds, we still need them. We still need to engage with them. So don't be silent with your donors. And now's a really good opportunity, as, as Barbara will, will talk later on in the presentation, I'll, I'll bring up. Now's a really good opportunity to bring on new donors mm -hmm. who might be donating to an organization that isn't reaching out to them, who isn't thanking them in the right way. Uh, so we can cast your net a little bit wider and, and help you even bring on some additional donors. Uh, mm -hmm. during, uh, That's an interesting tact, uh, really. I mean, in, in, a, in, a, in the sense, because this point that, you know, they may be donating to fewer causes, 
you know, you can sort of change the, the prominence of your cause, you know, someone else's decision to pause, maybe allow someone to pivot a different direction. Uh, it's the first time I've said pivot since the pandemic started to, to, to <laughs> slow, but uh, I guess it's always there. Um, I'm going to tell you that. So if we're not pausing, what are we doing? We're hitting play, you know, but we're also fast forwarding. I mean, you really have to like, you know, go at it full on, right? That's going to mean different things for different folks, but you know, those that ask uh, and that really level up their fundraising. So I, there's sort of this thing, as you were talking, Barbara, I thought, um, you know, the thing that Lily had mentioned where she's saying that, you know, uh, that people during inflation, it really impacts uh, fundraising. And I always look at this uh, and I don't know what movie reference to make, but it's sort of that place like, is the future determined? You know, do you have the ability to change it? Is this already right? And I think that all of, a lot of times, and we put a lot of this stuff out there too, a lot of research, it's talking about even the state, you know, given that we're in stasis and we're not, we have no momentum, uh, momentum movement going forward can really have a lot of uh, say in how things actually uh, turn out for you. And that's an important point here. So, you know, there's some, there's some things that are working particularly well right now. And, uh, you know, Ken, Ken, if you want, uh, want to maybe start to walk us through those and Barbara chime in as well, that would be great. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, back to the phrase of don't be afraid to ask um, for at least an hour space in the event specific event fundraising specific space. Uh, we probably helped a lot of you that were on this call with a virtual or a hybrid event when mm -hmm. the pandemic was going on. Uh, what we have seen across the country since the beginning of the year is a transition to in-room events. Donors are, um, poor choice of, of, of words here, but the donors are starving for the opportunity to be around other like-minded people in a face-to-face -face environment. Uh, and with the pandemic over, we have the opportunity to get into a room with people, whether it's 50 or uh, 5,000. Uh, people are more generous yeah. when they are together, and uh, they're excited to do that. So uh, David has used the phrase, uh, live is alive, mm -hmm. um, and, and it truly is. And that's something to give consideration to. Planning for an in-person event uh, is, is challenging. It's time-consuming, but it is well worth it, and we're seeing the, uh, the amount of returns and yield uh, to be as high as they were pre-pandemic. We're going to uh, we're going to the very top point is going to be a nice segue to this next session section. Excuse me, that Barbara is going to be taking us through. And the fundamentals is kind of like the back to this is a football. Get your game right, right? And mm -hmm. kind of looking at that. But I'll just tell you that, and these are not individual. Like we're going to unpack all of these. They're going to be themes. So there's sort of this notion that a lot of what you know isn't necessarily going to be, you know, innovation isn't always brand, brand new. It's new to you or it's re, you know, discovering things you've done and doing them right. So sound strategy, planning, and execution are always in style. We're going to talk about the giving season, year-end, and year-round fundraising. Uh, we, and when we talk about it, we'll move that hyphen a little bit closer to year. I don't know what happened there, Ken, sorry. And um, so uh, we're going to talk about digital mobile fundraising, of course, in a sense of what the approach is, but it, how do you make it easy to give more and to give more in lots of different ways? How do you use some of these other strategies that we talked about? And, you know, who do you partner with? So, you know, Barbara, I'm going to turn it to you to kind of carry us to the next piece here on that first point, though, because that's the essence of everything we're talking about today. Yeah, and I want to just pick up on something that um, Ken had mentioned um, about live events, and I completely agree. I think there is, uh, you know, those organizations that have been doing, have gone back to doing some sort of live event, have really uh, been seeing great returns. However, donors are also now in very used to doing virtual stuff, and so whether it's um, virtual meetings with de uh, development staff or nonprofit executive leaders or attending some sort of event virtually. So I think that point around the, the last point or second to last point about hybrid is uh, is something that we want to be uh, always thinking about. Yeah. Because, you know, who wants to have a, you know, we've all gotten used to not having to travel and find parking and do all the stuff that we used to do when we and everything was at, was only in person. So part of the innovation point that you mentioned, David, is not just necessarily doing new things, but learning from what worked and didn't work and iterating off of that. So really thinking about 
um, over the last couple of years, where were we as fundraisers able to really deepen relationships with organizations and bring it to a different level? And how do we carry that forward in this new world order that we're finding ourselves in? Absolutely. Great point. So we're going to move forward to talking about, you know, not only are the fundamentals important, let's just go mm -hmm. ahead and, and say they're more important than ever. Uh, talk to us about that. Yeah, so these are, um, as we, hopefully everyone who's joining us today is uh, well on their way with their year in planning, uh, with their copy, their, their timelines, their scheduling, their print production, and so forth, um, getting their boards activated. Uh, but these are some tips that you know, are, are good for both year end um, and just throughout the year. But, but since we're really at the precipice of uh, going uh, full gas on the, you know, foot on the, ga the gas pedal and, and zooming into the end of the year, really think about um, in your uh, appeals, whether they're electronic or print, how can we be most strategic and personal? Um, this idea of, well, and this is a default for electronic communications like emails, for example, where we think, okay, we've got X number of names on our mailing list. We're just going to email everybody to make a gift. Well, the, the, the reality is that the percentage of emails that are now opened nowadays is, is going down, um, is declining pretty quickly. All of our inboxes are completely overwhelmed. Uh, and we know that being more strategic in our segmentation uh, and being more personal really uh, goes a long way. So think about what are those segments, and we'll talk about this on the next slide. Um, think about uh, bringing in what we know work well for, from neuroscience and from our, our for-profit colleagues who do this all the time in their sales um, around anchoring and social proof. So anchoring uh, is something where when you give a, a gift array, you start with something that's the, that is the highest amount. So that's the anchor. And the donor might say, I can't give that amount. Oh, but that other amount I can give. So it, it helps the donors and helps all of our brains, which are always looking for shortcuts to make those decisions quickly about how much to give. Um, social proof is using language like donors like you or others have been giving at this level. We often see this on printed pledge forms. We often see this on uh, donation pages that might have a, a little you know, handwritten circle that pops up on the donation form that says average gift of our donors is this amount. Again, it helps us to feel like others, we're, we're, we're gonna be like others, right? And again, we're, we're anchored, our brains are hardwired for that social proof. Um, specific asks, to ask don't to be, donors want to know how can I be most helpful? Wh how, where do you want me to make my gift? How do you want me to make my gift? And how much? So don't leave, make it a guessing game for them. And especially if they are returning donors, if they've been going, giving to you year over year, try to be as, as uh, clear as you can and remind them how much they gave previously. Um, they're, we, they, are, they are not going to remember what gift they made November of 2021. So uh, make a little, put it in the note or in the email saying your gift of $500 last year was so important to do this, this, and this. Would you consider an, you know, another gift of that amount or an increase or whatever? But make it uh, as specific and as easy for them to, to uh, decide whether they're going to support your organization. Um, and think about that multi-channel. We, again, often default to electronic communications because it's cheap uh, or, or free for many, uh, and it's easy. It's easy to do. We don't have to worry about getting into a print production queue. So, uh, but we know from some studies that multi-channel is, uh, is definitely going to be the way to go. It is much more effective. We always well, and even, uh, I, I'm sorry, Barbara, I would just say, I'm, I'm looking at digital only leaves money on the table. And, you know, from a company that does digital, it does lots of other things too. I go, yes. And also, you know what? Only doing one, like one, staying in one lane on the yeah, digital. Of course. You got, yeah, you got so many different devices, right? I've yes. got uh, seven of them open right now. I'm not going to tell what they are, but they're all open. <laughs> <laughs> Right, but our donors are in all of those places. And so um, we want to make sure we're meeting our donors where they are. We always want to be thinking about how do we uh, learn from what happened at the end of the year so that we can include the right stewardship, we can include the right um, touch points for those who gave and didn't give. 
Uh, and absolutely front and center donor retention has to be driving all of your communications because if we um, are losing our donors, then we're just perpetuating that churn. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to remind everyone as I transition uh, forward to the next slide, be sure to keep asking questions. I am seeing your questions, your comments, and some of them are being answered. We're going to come back to them. But any insights, any thoughts, or and even just sharing the kinds of things you've done that reinforce these points, I think, to your point, uh, you know, donors like you, are mm -hmm. nonprofits like you, right, are doing this. So let's all sort of leverage that good advice. So there are a lot of different ways that you can segment. Um, and whether you are using um, uh, AI tools that can help you to really discern those uh, segments within your audience that are more likely to upgrade to certain levels or are the ones that are most likely to be one and dones and a whole variety of different segmentation options. Um, the, if, if your systems are not um, uh, that capable or if you don't have the staff bandwidth to do all of those um, more sophisticated segmentations, a, a great starting point is just understanding who gave last year but not yet this year. Uh, and again, we because we are living and breathing our organizations all the time, we assume all of our donors are too, but we're just like we're all busy, they're all busy. So just remind them, remind them that this is uh, why their gift has been so important to your organization and invite them to make another gift. Those new donors, absolutely, we've got to be focusing on them. Uh, and so for current and new donors, this is where I see organizations say, well, we've, they've already made their gift this year. We're not gonna solicit them again. But in fact, current and new donors might want to make another gift if they're asked. Monthly donors, I often see organizations say, they're already giving, we're not gonna bother them. Sometimes I hear, we're not gonna remind them that they're making that monthly gift uh, because they might cancel it. That's, that's the, the, the wrong mindset. So monthly donors do wanna know has my gift been helping? You need some additional support. What, what other ways can I make a gift? And they are often ones who will consider uh, an out of the, out of the typical timeline uh, solicitation. So absolutely think creatively about those donors. And those who have not been giving, uh, you, you can typically, we don't see a high success rate by reactivating donors who haven't given for more than two years. Usually even for two years, that two-year mark, it's like 5% or on or below, but it's still worth uh, reaching out to them with a, hey, we miss you. Let me tell you all the things that we've been able to do because of past donors like you. Uh, we know during the early days of the pandemic that there was some pretty surprising reactivation rates from donors who had been longer lapsed uh, and had come back to support organizations that they had previously given to. So Let's not completely rule them out, but you know, the, let's also think about how we personalize that communication so that they still feel like they're part of your family. Um, and so at the end of the day, as Penelope Burke said in her book, Donor-Centered Fundraising, and she really coined that phrase about 20 years ago, if you aren't familiar with Penelope, uh, I definitely recommend you find, you re look for her book. She's done, she's done a 2.0 version of this uh, within the last, I think, three years or so. Uh, and she has studied for the last two decades donor uh, motivations. She's learned a lot about what is important to donors, what drives them and what doesn't. And what she said in one of her, um, one of the chapters of her book was that fundraising underperformance is a failure to communicate. So when donors don't know that they're valued, when they don't know how they could be helpful, when they don't know where, where things are with your organization, particularly in these uncertain times, they aren't going to step up in the ways that we would like them to. Uh, they're not mind readers. So we really want to be thinking about our, looking at our numbers and seeing what are our retention rates like? What are our return uh, on our, towards our goal like? Are we hitting any, are we not hitting those goals? And if so, how do we change that donor experience so that we can start to engage them more, more uh, um, successfully? You know, I love this quote because, uh, you know, when you see it, I'm thinking, oh, that's sort of often said about relationships as well. And, and then I thought of another quote, and I don't have it verbatim, but it's something along the lines of fundraising isn't an action, it's a relationship. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so it makes good sense. Mm -hmm. 
So about that multi-channel um, study. So back in 20, at the end of 2020, uh, the, the, com the, the team at Next After did a little um, experiment and they do tons of experiments uh, on all different kinds of, um, of digital fundraising, especially uh, and, and um, email marketing and so forth. And they did this study about multi-channel um, uh, communications. And what they found was that those, who were those donors who were communicated with offline, so in print pieces, uh, and digitally, email generally, or uh, other ways, that the, the ones who were, multi, who were communicated with in both ways, online and offline, were three times more generous and actually two times more likely to be retained. So again, it, it draws on the fact that our donors, as all of, as all of us, our donors are, um, we're competing for their attention. And they're going to be they're going to be focused everywhere, right? In their their emails and in their social platforms and print and family and in person stuff and all of that. If we can meet them where they are in multiple ways, our likelihood to in, to engage them, to encourage their gifts, and to keep them is going to be higher if it's multi channel. Uh, and we also know that generally direct mail with email. Uh, and another study I saw lifted the response rate by about 30%. So even that by just by the itself increased the response rate. And we're seeing in this study, increase the average gift, it increased the retention. So um, it, as you are, you know, fighting the good fight of in, trying to encourage your leadership to carve out a budget for uh, print, for direct mail, yeah. show them this because you are definitely going to be leaving money on the table if you only keep to digital communications. You know, Barbara, I, I, in previous uh, years, I was in advertising and marketing. I'm still in advertising and marketing, just in, in, the, in a great space here. But, um, you know, there was something when I was with television uh, advertising, they called it roadblock or roadblocking. Mm -hmm. And it's really just making sure that you're running your campaigns across all the different channels. So back in the day when you would turn the knob, you'd turn from one channel to the next and you yep. keep seeing the same commercial. Yep. Uh, it takes a while. It takes some frequency for people to get the message. Yep, 100%. Um, and I Barbara, see that, oh, yeah. sorry. I, I did have a question uh, for you, actually, uh, that may benefit the, uh, the attendees. W what is your opinion of utilizing a board as an extension of the fundraising staff within an organization? Uh, and what I mean by that is not just a peer-to-peer -peer or a team fundraising sort of thing, but picking up the phone and making the request directly. 100%. Um, and uh, I, that's a whole session unto itself, but, uh, and I will stay off my soapbox, but that is 100% uh, a, a great way to engage your board. Um, that is, when I, when I do board trainings, I, I tell them that there are two non-negotiables to their jobs uh, in, with regard to fundraising. It's A, that they've got to make their own gift, and B, that they have to be good stewards, uh, which means doing thank you calls, thank you notes, doing some sort of outreach. Now, that said, we've got to make it super turnkey and easy for them. So giving them scripts, telling them who they we, we, you would like them to donate to call, um, showing them the, the, the research that, show, that, that demonstrates that their outreach will improve donor retention um, and will, will improve likelihood that donors will make increased gifts. Um, uh, so I would say absolutely encourage them to, um, to do at least thank you calls and thank you notes yeah. to start. And then I also see, um, Susan just had asked, do we send an email before or after the direct mail? And I, um, I would recommend both. Uh, I often find sending an email like a week or two before the direct mail drops as, uh, is a nice primer to receiving the direct mail. Uh, it doesn't have to be a direct ask. It could be uh, a really nice stewardship piece or a feel good story or a video that uh, will get the donor's attention uh, and will remind them of the impact that their gift has made. Then the, it's followed with the direct mail piece and then probably a couple weeks after doing another uh, email. Now there's there, that's, having a whole series of emails throughout the end of the year um, is pretty standard, but I would say particularly around when that direct mail piece drops, ensuring that there is some, some touch points that are digital um, to tie it all together. And usually it's a better practice to have that story linked. So some reference uh, perhaps in um, one of the appeals to the same story that you're gonna share in the other 
uh, the other pieces is, is important. So we also then, you know, we're, we're focused nose down into end of year uh, planning, but when we are thinking about 2023, when we've crossed the threshold of December 31st, we, you know, turn the calendar page to 2023, we breathe a sigh of relief, and then we say, okay, now what? Uh, now, for those of you who um, are will begin a new fiscal year, you know, that's if you haven't already developed your development plan for the year, that's what you, one of the first things, of course, you're going to want to do. But uh, an important starting point, whether you're starting a new fiscal year or sort of somewhere in the middle of um, that fiscal year, you want to look at what worked and didn't work. So uh, for, for the year end campaign, because, you know, um, 30% of all gifts come in through in December. Um, so this is a busy season, whether we uh, uh, realize it or not, just even on our own orbits. So think about things like, what was the stewardship experience like? Did we thank them quickly? Um, or are we slow to, to get those, those gift acknowledgements out? Let's not also assume that an email thank you is enough. So really understanding where can we add a little bit more personalization so that donor feels seen? How did those donors make their gifts? Does, is it different in terms of amounts, in terms of average gifts, in terms of the number of donors, in terms of the, the vehicle through which um, they made their gifts? Is it different in, from, in this year than in previous years? Um, so run, you can run those reports from your, your CRM. Who didn't renew? This is especially if we're thinking, if we're facing uh, the, the, the eye of the hurricane of inflation right now and you know, starting to look, for, look ahead to recession, to a recession which Jamie Dimon at, at uh, Morgan Stanley has predicted will start probably in February or March, um, th this is the time when we really wanna be looking at who didn't give um, and maybe reach out to them. Are they, were they longtime donors that didn't make a gift for the first time this year? Good, good reason to find out why. Um, or were there other um, donors that, you know, that churn for some reason, sending them a little survey or sending them a little note that still says thank you to them is important. Those first time donors, absolutely, we've got to double, we got to front end the stewardship and the, the gratitude for them because they often are the ones who are going to go first. So the Giving USA report uh, that comes out every June looks at national trends of giving. Um, and it looks at the previous fiscal, uh, sorry, previous calendar year. And um, historically, um, it, it will show sort of the, the average, what we believe are the estimated contributions in these, in these ways. And what we see pretty consistently, although these numbers have changed a little bit, um, certainly from 2020, which was looking at 2019, yes, the numbers are going up, for sure, uh, I think it was 487 billion or 484 billion, uh, which once, once again set a new record. But uh, we know that the number of donors is decreasing. We know that um, the number of the percentage of individuals has decreased a smidge, uh, it's at 67%. But when we factor in bequests, which is of course made by individuals and about half of that foundation number because it's from family foundation, they're still in the high 80s, almost 90%. So when we are thinking about um, our own development planning, we really want to factor in wh where to best focus our limited time. And individuals um, is, is what we are seeing as a national trend pretty consistently. Corporations, interestingly, so this number has decreased. The amount that they gave in 20, uh, 2021 was an increase uh, by I think about 10% or something uh, uh, from over the previous year, but the percentage uh, of the total has decreased by about a percentage point. So the, the number, so this is not going to be consistently a uh, point, uh, any area that we should be focusing a lot of time on because interestingly bequests, right? That that's double what, what the amount is given by corporations. So as we are thinking ahead, while, although we're focused on year end, as we look ahead, if you don't have a, a uh, plan giving program or some way where you're promoting bequest intentions, this is the time to be doing it because we know that um, that number has been, that amount has been going up and the great wealth transfer is happening. And we wanna be sure that we are 
uh, offering ways for donors to leave their legacy gift uh, to the causes that are important to them now. So I know, uh, Ken, a lot of times, uh, one, one area, just sort of a different, uh, you know, uh, take on it as well in terms of corporations related to what you're doing. Yeah, thank, <clears throat> pardon me. Thank you, David. One of the things that we see that works well it was the corporate sponsorships mm -hmm. and the visibility that those corporations get from uh, being visible to the attendees at at uh, fundraising events. It's typically their the audience they're trying to seek in with their general marketing dollars. So uh, a dollar spent at a fundraising event where uh, the average net worth of an individual is much higher than someone who's driving down the highway looking at a billboard uh, allows me as a business owner. Uh, to want to sponsor your event. One of the other things that works well is uh, corporate tables, but you have to be careful with corporate tables because we want them to bring bidders, not eaters. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is oftentimes you have a table of 10 and you have a couple of corporate sponsors and they each get a table of 10 and they'll send uh, a junior member, let's say it's a law firm, they'll send a junior member and they'll say, hey, invite some people and a couple of clients and fill the table yeah. for us. It's really important with the messaging that they understand that with this corporate table comes responsibility your responsibility is to bring people to be exposed to our to our organization who will understand and appreciate our mission. And ultimately, you want to treat your uh, your in-person event as a, a method of cultivating major donors over time, which is something I'll touch on a little bit uh, in my section. So um, uh, I feel like this is one of my personal soapboxes that um, I, I need to keep saying loudly and more and more loudly because we haven't moved the needle in changing this in the sector. Um, on average, uh, according to the Fundraising Effectiveness Project, donor retention is about 43%. And uh, there was a study that I just, or um, a comparison I was just um, talking to a colleague about, and I think the hospitality industry is at like 75%. And we are um, of all of the other for-profit retail, uh, for-profit and retail um, loyalty percentages. We're the lowest, so often this would be um, a bellwether for, uh, you know, sort of uh, a company going, going, you know, closing. And yet the the nonprofit sector thrives in lots of other ways, despite the fact that we are not keeping our donors uh, in record numbers. Yeah. So. We do want to focus on our own organization's retention. Are we able to keep the donors who have said, I believe in your work and I'd like to continue, I'd like to support you? Uh, because if we lose sight of that number and are only ever focusing on our revenue goals, we are perpetuating churn yeah. and we are wasting precious time that we, I know many people on this call have, are wearing multiple hats and we're wasting time if we're not yeah. focusing on keeping those donors. And those first time donors that I referenced earlier only on average 20% of them are sticking around. Again, Crazy. because they're testing the waters, they're seeing, is this an organization that really values me? And I don't mean pulling out the red carpet and um, giving them all sorts of special attention, but ge genuine gratitude, genuine thank yous, uh, giving them valuable information that shows the, the importance of, of all gifts to the work that they're doing. And we That's fail to often. It's back to your point on communication, right? I mean, we, we've done, we've talked about thank you not being enough. It's not that it's not important. It's that sometimes it's not just saying the words thank you. It's that, but you don't show me that you appreciate me, right? Um, and I think that as we're looking at donor retention, another important point when you're talking about economic challenges and inflation and higher costs is that it costs, and it's, it varies who you talk to, but four times as much to retain a donor yeah. as it does to acquire a new donor. So, you know, let's step into our common sense corner and say this makes sense for that reason as, long, uh, yeah. as well. Yeah. So, so we're going to, again, kind of, it's one of those things where it's sort of like, uh, there's a little bit of a duh factor. It's like, we're, we, you know, things are costing more, demand is greater, we need more money. Uh, so what should we do? And the, the, you know, the answer sort of becomes, well, you need to raise more money, right? So that what brings us to, to this then is that, so what are those things that we really need to be thinking about? We're, they're not everything that we've ever heard, but they're a lot of the things. And some of it boils down to making it easy for donors to give and to give more in multiple ways so that you're getting more from everything that every interaction that you have wherever possible with best practice ways of doing things through a lot of things that we're going to talk about. So 
you know, uh, one of those things that I want to just put out, and we're, this is not a Giving Tuesday or even a Giving Season, uh, oops, sorry, uh, webinar, but um, we do want to talk about it because it's coming up very quickly. And also there's this overarching thing that one of the things that you want to be doing is taking advantage of, you're trying to raise more money, you know, it's the most wonderful time of the year. So what do you, how do you leverage that? Thoughts, Barbara, Ken? Yeah, so um, Giving Tuesday uh, has proven over the last 10 years or so that it is a powerful phenomenon um, that, that really it catalyzes and inspires donors um, to give in lots of different ways. Um, but it is, um, it's not an exercise that exists in isolation. So it requires planning and it requires um, an organization to have a, a, a general cadence of, of communications already that can lead up to that Giving Tuesday um, sort of uh, promotion. One study I saw referenced that, um, that Giving Tuesday donors are typically donors to the organization that they support on that day anyway. Um, but the, so that's, that's one data point. Um, but it also it is, um, it's not something that is, um, uh, I've been, I've long been a skeptic and a critic of Giving Tuesday, but I've come around, I've been, I rethought my perspectives on the day because I see how powerful it is. And so it could be a nice way uh, to use it to thank your donors. Um, you might manage your expectations and if you decide that you wanna do some sort of communications that day and promote your, your nonprofit, use it to, um, uh, but manage your expectations that this isn't going to, it's not going to start raining money just because you put out a couple posts. So, um, and you, it's also okay to not participate on the day. Uh, and I think where I, where my, my previous skepticism always came into play was because I saw so many organizations who were like, I've got this pressure for my, my ED or my CEO and my board to do something. We don't have the bandwidth. It's going to do, it's going to take all of these things, and and then and then they come back and say, but we only raised a couple thousand dollars, and you know, and so it's it, then there's sort of those mismanaged expectations. So I would say, it's okay if you don't if you decide not to do it, but if you do decide to do it, ma manage what is reasonable for your bandwidth, and also ensure that you're building in the time that you need to uh, plan it well. You know, the uh, we, we just put out a guide on, on Giving Tuesday, like everyone in the world, right? I don't think there's a lot of great info in there, yeah. um, but we purposefully talk and a lot of our leaders talk about, you know, the, the whole notion, don't just do it because everyone's doing it. Yeah. You know, don't just, don't, and, and be sure you understand what your, what your outcomes are. Do you want to bring in new donors? Do you want to bring in, you know, do you want to bring in money? Do you want to bring in young donors? Do you want, you know, what are the things you're trying to do instead of, an expectation, but we also talk about it in the sense that don't just think about this as Giving Tuesday. It's purposefully worded as think about this season. Yeah. And I can't see everyone's face right now. I can see hands if you virtually raise them, but you don't need to. I know the answer already. How many of you have overspent, uh, ever overspent on, uh, spent more than you wanted to? Let's not say overspent, spent more than you wanted to out of generosity during the holidays. Mm -hmm. Can't get those hands up. Okay. <laughs> All right. You know, it's, I mean, it's the, it, it isn't that someone, if people have the, if they have the wherewithal to give, they're inclined. This is the time to be able to tell your story. And someone asks, how do we adjust that year end approach? It's the same kind of uh, thinking that you want to tell your story well. You want to make a compelling case for support. And you don't want to just fundraise and say, hey, it's Giving Tuesday. You still want to get to the fundamentals of telling why you, what this is going to mean, what's going to be the impact. And, and let the data inform your decision. So if you can and analyze how much have you raised in previous Giving Tuesday campaigns, uh, and is it worth that effort? If it's a couple thousand dollars and from very few donors, you probably could do, you could probably raise more with more personal outreach by maybe asking those board members to call those yeah. donors who haven't yet made their gift or those inactive donors who um, might be inspired to give back. And so that you, there are other ways that you might raise more money 
without all the stress of feeling like you've got to, you know, get into the Giving Tuesday, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, campaigns. Phenomenon. Yeah, I really, I, and I really want to give Ken time on the live auction of some of the events because this is an interesting thing. Your your brand might say, well, people don't want to spend money and take time and go out and do that. There's a different story there. But before I do that, I'm going to gain us some time and kind of walk through a couple of these like best practices that are are really important to be thinking about year round. So they all almost all apply. I think all of them actually do apply to the giving season, right? But there are things you wanna be doing because you need to be doing this throughout the year so that people know you're around, you need help. You don't want people giving and just giving during the giving season. And then you're sitting there swimming for funds, you know, uh, paddling for funds, I should say in the middle of the year. So, you know, make sure you have lots of ways to tell your story through, through you know, making sure that you're online. Um, but you know, recurring giving is a great strategy. Setting up campaigns, particularly in these times, if you can give $20 a month, you know, or $22 a month for 2022, and you can set up a campaign that enables that, recurring givers or monthly donors, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm hungry, monthly donors, as they're sometimes called, um, you know, give, uh, are shown to give something like five times as more annually, and to have much greater retention, obviously, they're bound to you, right, you know, over the course of a year than a one-time donor. Uh, and tribute giving, people are going to give more in honor of somebody uh, or in memory of someone uh, just because there it is and they're moved emotionally and they're gonna wanna make sure they do that. And it gives people another way to give. Matching giving, it's a big part of your know, strategies for Giving Tuesday, it's a big thing. In terms of just uh, someone, you know, the, the uh, numbers that are oftentimes thrown out, like 84% of people would be more inclined to give uh, if they knew there was a matching gift, they want to give and they're saying, well, I don't want to give my 25, but if I could give 50, that's terrific, right? So they're going to do that. And then also, you know, they're going to be inclined to give more when that happens. So, well, since it's being matched, I'd rather do 50 and get to 100. So those are important things. Raise assist is something we talk about a lot here. Uh, cover the processing fees. If you have fees of whatever percent they are or other things you want to sort of build into that donation, uh, again, research will show that 85 to 90 percent of people will leave the box checked when you say, would you like to cover the processing fees? Because why wouldn't they want the most to go to your cause? That alone could increase your yield by two, three, four you know, percent, whatever that is. Uh, making sure things can be done through a phone, uh, being able to have people come to events and register, which Ken will be talking about, but then leveraging the power, the networking effect, if you will, of being able to get to the friends and family and networks, professional and personal people to be able to leverage teams and then to sort of play off of Penelope Burke's, you know, donor-centered, talking about donor-centric websites. If someone comes to your website to do something, allow them to do all kinds of things to support you very easily. Prominent donate now button, find out what events you have, learn about where this is going, seeing the impact. And then this is my segue, and I, I don't want to take away from this. I'm just going to, as I segue, if you guys want to chime in on any of these, but then we'll turn to Ken talking about live is alive and why. You guys good? I'm okay. Yeah, well, I'm okay, okay transitioning unless there are any Perfect. questions from the, from the audience. So uh, thank you for the, the very smooth transition. One of the things that uh, touches back onto what Barbara is, is sharing with all of us is a, a point that I want to make is that regardless of the financial situation and how we perceive it personally and how we are personally affected by it, donors still make donations. They just donate to fewer causes. And you cannot assume that your organization is the one that they're thinking about. So you must go out, you must ask them to participate. You have to request those donations. And the multi-channel approach that Barbara had mentioned uh, that, that uh, is utilized to, you know, in conversations in our space, one of those channels is a live event. Uh, there was a comment earlier that I, I, I missed it, but I'll get back to it. Someone asked about, you know, uh, what do you think about doing a, you know, like a, a, a friend raising? Uh, sort of uh, sort of event uh, that ties in with with live events in general, uh, whether it's a, a live auction gala, golf fundraiser, or, or anything else that might fit your uh, your mission. Uh, fit, might fit your mission uh, well. Uh, over the last couple of years, uh, we have seen the people that have transitioned from the virtual and the hybrid back into live in-room events. Uh, their yields 
have increased and they have uh, they've raised more money than they have even pre-pandemic uh, to uh, to Barbara's point uh, we should take from from the pandemic some things that we learned and things that went well and uh, that is expanding the room let's say for example that you are considering a live auction or you, you've been in this business as long as I have and you you know this next year will be your 35th anniversary event um, you're probably limited on the amount of people you can fit into the room Let's say, for example, that you live in a major metropolitan area and uh, you have a convention center and they can open up the walls and you can fit 1,000 people in there. Uh, that might not be the right size for you, but let's say, for example, that you can fit 250 or, or 500 people in the room. You still have donors that wish to participate, but they just might be in other places in the country or they might be traveling. Uh, some of you on the call have probably been in organizations that are the size that, oh my goodness, our major donor is on vacation. We have to change the date of our event. Right? We've, we've all been there. Um, but you don't need to do that anymore. You can employ different, uh, different services. Uh, mobile bidding, as an example, expands the room. It allows people to participate, even if they're not in the room. Uh, and there's some, some detailed information I, I can share uh, uh, with individuals that are interested in that uh, on how you should do that, the right way to do that. Uh, because you don't want to incentivize people to stay home. You really do want them to be in the room looking across the table when you do the, we call it fund the mission or fund the need or the appeal. Someone comes up on the stage, they talk about your mission, maybe they're a recipient of your services. Uh, it's the emotional appeal of the event, and you have a professional auctioneer. Uh, I can talk, that could be an entirely different session. Uh, if you're using a volunteer auctioneer, I'm sure they are a wonderful person, but if they are not a professional charity auctioneer, you are absolutely leaving money in the room. And I'm happy to sidebar on that after this call as well and explain to you some of the things to ask. Um, but what you do is you have them come up, you, they, they make their appeal, um, and they start the, the, you start your ask at, let's say, for example, uh, you know that you have a major donor in the room that's willing to donate 25000 You start there, and then they ask if anyone will match. It is nearly impossible to do that via text or email. I'm not going to make a $25,000 donation unless I can look across the room at one of my counterparts or another person in there who is saying, yeah, I'm, I'm raising my bid card. Uh, you know, I'm bidder 150. I'm raising my bid card at $25,000. And they look around the room and make eye contact with other people that they know have the ability to make that same donation. Yeah. Um, you, you have to be face-to-face -to, -face, uh, to make that happen. So um, what's working well in auctions, uh, that as an example, uh, the in-room events will, will actually get you more donations than, uh, than a virtual event, as an example. Um, but we have to go back to what worked. And to Barbara's point, let's incorporate some of the things that worked well in the pandemic. So let's maybe hybridize our event. It doesn't work well for everybody, uh, but it does work well for those that do it the right way, and the right way is employing the right technology. Uh, you have to say thank you uh, repeatedly. And one thing I will share uh, before we wrap up here, because I'm, I'm bumping up against the end of time, is your attendees' last memory of your organization wasn't the, wasn't the speech, it wasn't the items that they won, it wasn't the uh, presentation, it wasn't the people sitting at their, at their table and how much fun they had, or the dance, or if you have music. It's when they check out. Their last impression of you and your organization is the checkout process, and you have to make sure that you're doing it well so that you're not thanking your donors by making them wait in a checkout line when they have to get home to let the sitter go home um, uh, for the evening. So, yeah. and, and there's some detailed information I can share about that uh, at a later time as well, but it's definitely something to give consideration to. The checkout is the most important thank you of the event. So keep asking those questions and answers. We're going to be, you know, taking just a quick uh, turn here to just sort of do a real rapid fire through some of the technology and the partners, not so much from a, you know, certainly not a sales pitch, letting you know what kinds of things are out there, whatever you're using that are an important part of this. You want to make sure you can do more uh, with what you have and extend what you're doing and do it in the right way to reach people in what is even more of a digital uh, you know, technology driven world. And it isn't uh, the only thing, it's just something that's an expectation that comes along with it. I expect to have a, a virtual option for everything. I expect to have a digital option and online. How can I do that? So how do you leverage the right partner or someone that's going to be with you uh, for good to be able to help you with all of these kinds of things? And, you know, so we just share that, you know, this is uh, from Ariva's perspective, we've been working with the nonprofits for more than 30 years. We have, you know, been able to raise all kinds of dollars and all kinds of uh, great results for nonprofits across all sectors. 
And we, uh, you know, our software is built exclusively for the nonprofit industry. What we really advocate for, however you do this, is to have an all-in-one approach. You look at all the things that are kind of laid out here. When you're fundraising and you're trying to raise more money during these times, um, having everything siloed in multiple databases, uh, in spreadsheets and manila folders, makes it very difficult to be able to do some of the things that Barbara was asking you to do, uh, to do early on, which is to know your donors. Knowing your donors means you have to get everyone together and look in their trunk and figure out where all of the data is stored and bring it all together. But if you can pull up an easy live on report of last year, but not this year, you know, kind of report and look at that on a real time basis, that's very valuable. So, we, you know, we look at trying to solve that challenge with uh, Exceed Further, which is our software. It's an all in one uh, cloud based digital fundraising donor relationship management. Healthcare, hospitality, even we work with uh, lots of organizations and Ronald McDonald House Charities with decades of experience working with them. And then also, as Ken mentioned, all of these auction solutions. Just showing you there's a wide range here. We're going to provide everyone a free fundraising consultation and demo with folks like Ken and our team and people that are going to be committed to helping you uh, throughout um, and people within uh, the whole Ariva team, you know, that are going to help you on any of these areas. Not a sales pitch. It's not come in and look at everything. If you don't want to look at everything, understand what things are important to you. And even if you want to just say, I still am not sure I know what to do during inflation and economic challenges. Or I heard a little bit about this. I'd like to know more. It can be five minutes. It can be an hour. It's been known to go longer if you want it to. Uh, so we have donor relationship management talking about all the kinds of things you can see here, digital fundraising. Uh, you know, we have the auction types of capabilities. We do work with hospitality organizations widely. Uh, as well, and then everything we do is is mobile responsive, and uh, no, you know, everyone again, raise your hand. You got a phone in it, you know, you can't see. I'm holding a phone. You got blip for a minute, you know. You it's with you all the time, you know, for everyone, and even and I, I've got to make this point because I've been making it more and more on everything we do. Folks who say certain ages just aren't comfortable with technology, they don't do things, they don't use their phones. If that was to the extent where that was ever true. Over the last couple of years, it is it is really hard to fathom because if you had grandchildren, you wanted to talk to them, you got on the phone. If you had to figure out how to get on a, a Zoom webinar, never uh, had heard of a Zoom except for it being an old public television show, you know, you needed to look at, you know, how do I go ahead and connect to this and, and do it? So people are very comfortable and not only comfortable, but have an expectation for this to be part of that conversation. So Ken, anything you want to point to here, just say this helps with this, this helps with that from some of the things you talked about. I did see some questions come in real quickly. Sure. I haven't looked at the questions, but the one thing I will mention is the, the hybridization of the events that we learned through the pandemic. You have a handful of people in the room, but you can expand the room, which is one of the phrases that I used. That's what the text to bid will do for you. Uh, there are, there are uh, many services out there. Uh, we are not the only one. Uh, you should definitely take a look around and see what's best for your organization, but it's certainly something for you to consider. If you do it well, it will absolutely help you raise more money. Okay, and then as you can see here, you know, there's an opportunity if you want a, uh, would like to even think about a, a fundraising consultation, let us know. But there's the services, uh, as Ken had mentioned, be happy to talk with you or anyone on his team about, uh, you know, the auctioneers, the consulting, about the whole ball of wax. Lots of organizations doing things out there. Ken and his team really do everything within what you need to do to make it a success. So, so that's a great thing. We like to say here, we're with you for good. Uh, we're not following you around, but we're with you for good um, to help you to achieve your causes. And, and uh, you know, if you want to uh, sign up for that, go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and move us to what I think is a very important, uh, you know, piece here to share a little bit. And uh, we're going to open it up to questions. And as we do that, I'm just going to say, if you want to let me know if you want a fundraising consultation demo with the Ariba or Microsoft team, or even are thinking about it, let us know, um, you know, and we'll put that uh up for just uh, another five, four, three, two, one. And I'll put it up again after we're done here, but I'm gonna let you know right now as I'm doing this, uh, I'm putting one up for if you would like to have updates uh, and receive news and updates. In other words, just sort of be on the, on the email kind of communications preference list uh, with uh, Barbara and her organization. She puts out great stuff. I, every time I need it, uh, you know, it, it shows up, Barbara. So it's great stuff and it's not overdone. It's the perfect mix. Um, you know, so she has, uh, they do a lot of things working with uh, nonprofits across the, uh, you know, across the board. And I'm just going to make another plug. 
If you go to the Ariva.com website and you go to our resources section, previous webinars that I've done with Barbara are there. One of them that Ken kind of uh, asked a question about, I remember so well, it was why your board doesn't fundraise and how to change that. And I have said how to change that now with an exclamation point. But it was uh, it was so powerful and it was so rich and it was it was a bit of therapy. It was really good for the community. Uh, there's some out there on superpowers on a lot of the great stuff about retention uh, for fundraising and everything. But uh, this is just great stuff. Uh, Barbara, you want to share anything else about what you do or what people can expect if they share their email with you? Yeah, and you've said it really well. We we send out um, pieces throughout the month. Uh, either we have a monthly newsletter and then other announcements of webinars and other uh, uh, events that I'll be speaking at. Um, and sometimes some other just points of inspiration that we want to share with the community outside of the newsletter. So um, yeah, we and we take our we take our the list privacy really seriously. So we do not spam you. We don't share lists. Uh, we really do look at this as how can we be in service of your fundraising. Great. So I am, uh, I, you know, I'm going to thank you more formally as we get to the very end. If you can stay with us, please do, because we've now got some questions and comments and, and things of the sort that we'll close up with. I'm going to let you know that at the end of the deck, when you receive it, there's a whole host of things about the kinds of resources uh, through Exceed Further that can help you do these things really, really well. So they're there for your reference. But again, I put up the, the ask if you want to uh, have that conversation with us. Uh, and just learn more about what kinds of things you might do, or even just pose a question to us. We'd love to talk with you. I'm going to turn it over to some of the questions here to see if I know we've been answering them throughout. But one of the things I did see was, uh, you know, looking at that mix of, of uh, you know, where the giving is, and someone saying that we found, I found across the organizations I've been in, is that the you know the majority comes from foundations and you know and grants, right? And and uh, and then someone chimed in that side conversation again to say, mm -hmm. you know, well that may be true, but for our organization, it's always the largest individual. So when you look at that chart, your organization mix may be very very different. But, um, you know, I guess it, it depends what types of industries you're in. Some are going to be very, very laden with, with grants and, and foundations. A lot of the things we've talked about are for, you know, that, that individual giving, but they're not exclusively that. I mean, awareness is awareness. But any thoughts on that question or the answers to it? Yeah, I, I hear that. Um... Uh, every almost every time that that chart is shared from the Giving USA, and the the reality is that that has been an ongoing trend line in the Giving USA report for uh, at least twenty years, um, as far as I can remember, at least. Um, so it's been uh, the, the individuals are are giving are, are the predominant lion's share of the contributed revenue. That said. Um, for every organization, yes, your own mix of revenue sources is going to be different. It may not be perfectly reflective of what we see on a national trend, but what you want to be answering for yourselves is what's our dependency quotient. So are we overly dependent on a certain number of donors or a certain type of donor? Uh, and how can we ensure that we are balancing our revenue so that we can mitigate uh, continued economic uncertainties. Uh, so those organizations, as, as important as events are, those organizations that were 99% or 95% reliant on event fundraising in 2020 had to figure out really quickly how to rebuild um, the, the fundamentals. So really think about your own organization's um, weaknesses and areas that might be, um, might cause some issues if the economy, if and when the economy turns, because it, it will, it will turn, yeah. it's turning now. I want to answer a question. Thank you, Barbara. I want to answer a question for uh, for someone that just asked, is Raise Assist a software platform? It's just sort of a coined phrase. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's actually much simpler than that. It's part of, it's the whole notion of allowing people to cover the processing fees. And when, that's how we officially refer to it, cover the processing fees, which means when you have a donation page or someone has something in terms of an event or you know somebody's doing something that has some sort of fee or, or uh, donation made with it you allow them to check or you automatically check and allow them to uncheck depending on on what you want to do the second by the way is the best practice most often recommended um but you know what you'll find is that people then will it will very clearly say you know there are some costs associated if you'd like to cover have your donation cover this it'll take your donation from you know 
100% to 100 to 3%, depending on, I mean, who you're working with, you know, for, you know, it could be much, much higher, obviously, but, and you can set it wherever you want to, if you want to have it cover something else, but it's just that notion of saying there are some costs associated with what we do. We allow for that within our Microsoft, within our Reva solutions and the things that we do. So it's a, it's a best practice. So thank you for asking. Ken, I have a question uh, that's kind of directed at you for auctions. Do donors generally tell you the full market value of the item they are providing for the tax letter you need to provide them? Absolutely. So the um, the fair market value is a requirement, and one of the things that I'll talk to our software very quickly um, is that once that fair market value is inserted, then you know the the amount that is paid over that fair market value is the potential tax deduction. So the donor, of course, will want to tell you exactly what that fair market value is because for their own taxes, they're going to want to claim that as a donation to your organization. Great. I'm, I'm, uh, it's interesting. I'm looking through these two and I just, I want to tell everyone, thank you all for joining us because the people I'm seeing have joined have got great stories to tell. Unfortunately, I can't plug them all and share them, but I do see some good comments that I do want to share. And I want to ask you a little bit about this, Ken. So someone said, we, you know, we held our most, our most successful gala this past Saturday and saw that, that desire to really saw that desire to be with other people. I've heard from multiple people, and I know you have as well, that people are giving, people are giving at these events and they're very generous. Why is that? I think that they're, as I touched on earlier, um, just like all of us, I mean, the, the people that come to events are just like we are. Uh, we've been on Zooms just like this. You know, our, half, of our, half of our staff is remote. We are desirous of being around other human beings. And when we are, we're excited. And if you have a worthy cause and you can communicate that to me as a donor, that excites me more when I'm in person, right? If you have someone, uh, I would imagine that this, this organization uh, likely did a, a fund the mission or an appeal, and that was probably stronger than they've seen in years because people were face-to-face -face with, the, with the results of the mission that they're being asked to support. And to Barbara's point, they're thanked immediately, right, with a round of applause. I've raised my yeah. bid card at $1,000, and there's 500 people clapping for me, and the excitement that builds around being in person is really what's driving the increased uh, increased yields and increased uh, funds raised. It's terrific. You know, there. I, it's interesting because as I look through this, that side conversation, the, the uh, crowdsourcing has taken over the question and answer because as soon as I find the questions that are here, someone's answered them in the chat. So please look through those as we continue to go here. We're, we're past a little bit past our time. We always like to extend it to folks because we have quite a few people that have stayed on. So what I'm going to do while you're scrolling through that, or if you have questions, drop them in the comment or in the question box, we'll be sure to, to look at those or even just let us know, even if you haven't answered, if you want to jump on and, and ask some questions, we're happy to talk about them. But I'm going to go ahead, you know, and just bring us back to uh, a little bit of the, of tying things, uh, you know, tying things up here and just, you know, again, uh, from our standpoint, I, I've got uh, to just practice what we preach and uh, say thank you. It may not be enough, but we want to thank you in multiple ways. Um, so I've learned a lot. And, uh, you know, uh, I want to thank uh, all of you for taking time out of your day, your busy schedules, so many things going on and all of the good that you do to be able to join with the nonprofit community here and share and learn and grow and all of those great things. I want to extend a very special thank you uh, from my perspective to, uh, to Ken uh, and uh, for his expertise, again, knowing that he's running a business and doing lots of great things and helping nonprofits, a uh, big dedicated uh, you know, effort to helping everyone go uh, even further. So uh, I'm going to let Ken go ahead and share any last words that he wants to share and then turn it back to me and I'll turn it over to Barbara to take us out and, and do the great. same. Yeah, thank you, David. Barbara, it's always a pleasure to be in your presence. You're a, a, a wealth of knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, so, David, uh, probably before you before you uh, sign us all off, you should put her slide back up so people, if they didn't mark down her email address, they should thank definitely you. reach out to her and be added. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you all for participating. Uh, there were some uh, questions in the chat that were uh, directed to me specifically, and I'm having a challenge. I've tried to respond to them within the chat window, but it's not working. Uh, so, David, I'm hopeful that uh, you can collect those for me and, and pass them along so I can reach out to those individuals and answer their direct questions. Yeah.
Uh, thank terrific. you, everyone, and I hope you have a, a, a super week. Uh, October's almost over, so don't be afraid to ask your donors. And the ones that have donated, don't forget to thank them. Again, thank you, Ken. Uh, thank you, everyone. And I'm going to just, uh, you know, I, I've, I've thanked you multiple times in working with you, Barbara. It's always a pleasure, and you give so much to the community in so many ways. So thank you for joining us. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to you for your final words and to close us out. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for having me back, um, David and Ken. It was great to collaborate with you on this. Um, and I would say that uh, for all of you who are um, uh, in the front lines and, and, and serving in lots of different roles in your nonprofits, uh, take each day as it comes, take care of yourself, uh, and remember that not everything is going to be an urgent priority. Yes, um, your fundraising needs to be a priority. And if everything that's dumped on your plate is not all related to fundraising and revenue uh, for your organization, then, then manage the expectations of those around you and manage your own um, to-do list because uh, you need to be able to, to continue to show up for work uh, and do all the important work that, you're, that you are doing for your organization and the missions that you're serving. So um, take good care of yourself and, and remember that this is a marathon and not a sprint, although it will feel like a sprint <laughs> or at least the beginning of a, of a sprint, but um, it, this is the long haul and building donor relationships, it takes time uh, and it's not all gonna happen in the next two months. So just, uh, just be patient with yourself. Okay, thank you again, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and uh, we'll be sending out a non, the next question is we'll be sending out an on demand recording as well as slides and sharing your uh, emails with uh, Barbara where you've asked. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful week. And until next time, uh, stay safe and stay healthy.